We are continuing our uh, testify. And this week I've asked uh, Kevin McDaniel if he would come up and, and share his testimony with us. So if you would give him your attention, and I'll give him the stand. Thank you. I'm against this one. The jack um, Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Kevin McDaniel. I've been going to this church for somewhere around seven years, I think, now. Um, also working with the youth for about six years now, the youth group in the church. So, um, My testimony could take all day um, if I wanted to, and on and on and on, because um, it's one that was a lot of disappointment um, in myself, and victory for the enemy, um, unfortunately, for a lot of my life. Because the, the problem was, I was actually, well, that's the wrong way to say it, the problem was. <laughs> Wonderful thing was, I was raised in a Christian home um, by parents who were really God-fearing, God-seeking people. Um, and I, of course, you know, went right along with that and learned how to read out of the King James Bible and, you know, very uh, much inundated with the word and knowing the truth of, of the salvation message and knowing the gospel of Jesus Christ um, very well from a young age. Um, and that's where the sad part comes in uh, because, um, well, I'm going to read really quick uh, a passage from Romans that I think supplies. Um, we actually studied this the other day um, at church. He was uh, bringing up Romans chapter 1. Oh, it's after Acts. Hang on. <laughs> Me, who knows the Bible so well, you know, from a young age. <laughs> uh, so down in uh, Romans chapter 1, um, I'm going to find the verse here. I don't have my Bible either. I left it in the richest trailer. I don't know if you found it. Um, Basically, it's talking about God's wrath on the unrighteousness um, and having no excuse um, uh, because God's invisible. Or here we go, verse 19. Um, For what can be known about God is plain um, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God. Or give thanks to him, but they became became futile in their thinking. Their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. And this is the verse I was really uh, wanted to talk about. Was verse 23? It says, "And exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling the mortal man and birds and creeping things." Um, and then down in verse, I can't find the verse where it says, "They exchanged the truth of God for a lie." Maybe it doesn't say it in this version that way. 25. 25, is that where it is? Because, yeah, there it is. Therefore, they gave, God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and worshipped and served the cre creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. Um, and that, that's basically what I did a lot, because I claimed to know the truth, and I did know the truth. I'd been following the truth under my parents' supervision, parents' guidance my whole life. Um, and then my father died when I was 15, um, and there went my whole support structure for my faith. Um, it wasn't a faith of my own, it was a faith based on just, I knew that was the right way, so I just followed it. I didn't have a personal relationship with Jesus, even though I believed everything um, about the Bible to be true. So, from there, I went downhill, um, I didn't, you know, like become a drug dealer or go, you know, kill people or stuff like that, you know, but I really did, um, if you know what I mean. Basically, one sin is the same as another in God's eyes. If we're not following him, we might as well be a murderer and a drug dealer. And a, um, if we don't have that personal relationship, then the rest of it doesn't matter at all. Um, and that's, that's where I was failing for quite a, quite a lot of years. Um, traveled around a lot, got to see a lot of the world and different places and meet a lot of people. Um, the sad part is, um, during that time, I was, you know, I basically still claimed to be a Christian and working with Christian organizations and um, leading Bible studies and, you know, all under my own power 
um, and then it had to finally fall. Um, so one day I was involved with an organization, a uh, Christian organization, and um, someone back home in Kalispell, I, where I was based out of at the time, I don't know if they got a vision from God or just what, what happened there, but they heard God's voice saying, hey, you need to help Kevin McDaniel. Um, and so basically they contacted people that were in authority over me over in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan where I was doing my training. Um, and so they all got together on the phone and had this conference and this prayer time all about me. And, you know, the people that called and the people that were in my in authority over me then didn't know each other, had no connection, nothing like that. It was just God worked together with, with, with godly wise people to uh, confront me. And they just came to me and said, hey, you know, what's going on with your... Uh, with your Christian walk, you know, oh, I'm doing good, God's blessing me, and so it's just, you know, the same old story, you know, hallelujah, just like everyone does on Sunday morning kind of thing, you know, um, put that face on, and, and they basically said, baloney, you know, what, tell me more about your personal relationship with God, you know, and uh, that was the starting point, basically, you know, I hemmed and hawed and tried to, you know, and then over the next few days and weeks, um, they didn't, they didn't force the issue at the time, but that's what started it, you know, and over the next few days and weeks, um, basically, I realized what I was doing, and verses kept popping to mind, and I kept reading stuff in the Bible about, you know, that Romans verse was a really big one, it was just the, that I, I, knowing the truth about God, exchanged it for a lie. I mean, that's the, the most foolish thing I can think of, you know, um, Anyway, after that, I got on fire for God and got to do some really amazing things. Um, and then, of course, downhill again and uphill again. And, you know, that's, I think, the story of all of us. Um, to me, the importance is, though, where you are today and uh, where you want to be tomorrow with it. What I mean by that is, obviously, where we are today with our relationship with Jesus Christ, our personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Um, and our time that we spend with him. Um, and then what's the goal? Where are you trying to go with it? You know, obviously, heaven is the ultimate goal. We don't want to burn in hell for eternity. I don't think anyone really has a desire to do that. Um, but that's the, 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 the point of us being here on earth and the point of us being Christians and still stuck in this earth, um, you know, is to share it and to spread it. You know, that's they call it the great commission. You know, to go forth into all the world and to share the gospel, to seek and to save the lost. Um, unfortunately, that's probably how do I put it? Where where the the world, where the Christian world, the American Christian church breaks down worst, I think. Um, because we can do great on our own, we can even have that great personal relationship with Jesus Christ where we, you know, our God is our rock and our salvation and we follow Him. But I believe that if we're not in some way actively pursuing the furtherance of His kingdom, you know, bringing other people to Him, sharing this awesome thing that we have and that we claim that, oh, this is the best thing in our lives. Well, if you have the best thing in your life, why don't you tell people about it? You know? Um, and that's kind of the point that, that God has been working on me the most the last five to ten years is just you know, my personal witness, my testimony, uh, I need to share that with other people. Um, so I went through all the ups and downs and trying to get myself straightened out. Even when it came to uh, <clears throat> working with the youth group here, I had some hesitation at first because I had come to the point to realize that, you know, I'm, I'm not, I have no value in and of myself. I'm not anything special. I'm afraid to teach these kids because what if they find out that I'm not perfect, you know, what if, you know, it's just all these things that came to my mind. And uh, that's when God basically said to me, um, you're never going to be good enough. You're a human being. You have a sin nature. You're never going to be the perfect example to, to young people. You're never going to be the perfect preacher and dynamic speaker all over the world with lights and whistles and bells. It doesn't matter. Um, you need to, where you are right now, do everything you can um, to further my kingdom, you know, to te teach other people, to bring other people. Um, I fail miserably in that because over the last few years it's kind of, hey, uh, 
I'm helping out with the youth group, that's good enough. You know, that's my outreach. I don't have to, that's, you know, confront people on the street now because I have my little niche, you know. I, I, I teach the youth, you know, but um, I don't think that's good enough either. Because if I'm not willing to share the light, share the truth, share the gospel everywhere I am, then it's kind of a show at church. It's a show at youth group, you know. You've got to live your life by it. Um, and kind of one of the things that I've been telling, and I'll end on this, um, one of the things that I've been working with telling a youth group um, is without the, the personal relationship with Jesus Christ, um, how, how, did that, how did that go? We were talking, just, just trying to think of how to word it best, but we, we, it's all worthless, it's pointless. If you're faking it, if you're tricking everyone, letting them think that you have this great relationship with Christ or that you're doing fine, getting by. <clears throat> who, who do, who, what good does that do anyone? You know, because you're definitely not tricking God. Um, probably not tricking as many of the people as you think. Um, but it doesn't help you, it doesn't help them, it doesn't help God, it doesn't... It's just a sham and it's foolish and worthless. Um, so that would be my encouragement and my challenge to you guys. Um, Examine your own heart. Examine your own life. Um, see where your personal relationship is with Jesus. Because um, we claim that to be the most wonderful, awesome thing in our lives, yet we put this much, a fraction of our time and effort towards that. You know, we save a slot for God usually in our life. And it should revolve around God and everything else. Kind of, kind of fits in. I'm not condemning anyone. I'm worse than anyone else about it, you know, about making that happen, but, anyway, I, I think I'm pretty much wrapped up, <laughs> my testimony is, is, was up and down most of my life, and I'm still going up and down, but pressing onward and, and trying to do the right thing, make, 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 uh, this here be, be what I'm living by, you know, what I'm trying to share, what I'm trying to, trying to, be an example of. So my testimony is ongoing. I don't have it right, uh, wrapped up with a nice little bow. Um, but anyway, I hope that's encouraging. <laughs>
is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him are all, all things were created in heaven. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> you probably feel a whole lot worse about it right now than I do. <laughs> For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. For he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of the cross. You just got a lifetime worth of knowledge in those few verses right there. And I really struggled this week. As a matter of fact, last night, I eliminated about 15 passages from my message today. And I still have quite a few. Because there is so much, oh, by the way, my text today, what I'm actually working on is, he is the image of the invisible God. That's it. Because I want to talk to you about Jesus Christ being God. And how this is not a New Testament thing. The Old Testament is replete with pointers and indicators and prophecies talking about God sending His Son to come and die for us on our behalf. <coughs> um, I, I made a mistake this morning. I had a book I wanted to bring. I was going to let some people that wanted to read it. Uh, Jeannie, it's the one by Menno Kalisher. Uh, what, what was the name of it? Jesus in the Hebrew Scriptures. In the Hebrew Scriptures, yes. Um, I got quite a bit of information on that. I got information from other places. I'm going to try and make this a cohesive thing because, see, we look at Jesus as being a New Testament happening. The New Testament doesn't stand without the foundation of the Old Testament. See, God put the Old Testament in place so that the New Testament could happen. Do you understand that? See, what day of creation was man created? What? Sixth. The sixth. What day of creation was it decided that Jesus would die for man? Before. Before. From the foundation of the earth, the Lamb was slain. See, God made man knowing him, what it was going to cost him. So, it wasn't like he went through all the history of the Old Testament and got to the end of Malachi and had to take 400 years to rethink. Well, what do we do now? Ah, I know. Matthew 1. That's not how it happened. But as Christians, a lot of times that's how we deal with it. That's what we think. We, we go, oh yeah, the Old Testament, neat and clever stories. Kind of like a personal genealogy of Jesus Christ. The history of Jesus. No, it's the history of man and his need for Jesus. And God's plan to put into effect the salvation of man through Jesus. Okay? You can't rightly understand the New Testament without understanding the Old. Okay? The law and the prophets were put into effect for our benefit. That we would have clear indication, that we would have clear understanding of what the New Testament is about. And we've got to go back, we're going to start in the Old Testament because, see, it says, I get puzzled about things. I ponder a lot about things. Things don't make sense to me. I know I'm denser than you guys and you got it all together. But bear with me. Okay? Because we're going to walk through this because it says, He is the image of the invisible God. What? If it's invisible, how can you see it? That's like saying, This is the 
the image of the wind. <laughs> Did you see it? <laughs> I did. He's the image of the invisible God. How can something that's invisible have an image? Ah, this is so cool. This is, okay. There we go. <laughs> Flip with me if you would back to um, Ezekiel. Chapter 1. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read a couple things here. I want you to hold them in your head for a little while. Because we're going to come back to you. Ezekiel chapter 1. It's on page 878 for those of you that have my Bible. <laughs> This is Ezekiel's vision. Okay? And I'm going to start in verse 26. There's, there's a lot that comes before it. But I'm going to start in verse 26. And it says, And above the expanse over their heads was the likeness of a throne, in appearance like sapphire, and seated above the likeness of a throne was a likeness with human appearance. And upward from what had the appearance of his waist, I saw as it were gleaming metal, like the appearance of a fire enclosed all around. And downward, uh, from what had the appearance of his waist, I saw as it were the appearance of fire, and there was brightness around him. Like the appearance of the bow that is in the sky, or in the clouds on the day of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness all around. Such was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell on my face and I heard the voice of one speaking. Who is Ezekiel looking at here? Who does he see? Jesus. He sees Jesus. See, flip with me over to Revelation. Now John, for a thousand years later, Okay, I'm going to start in verse 12. John says, Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the lampstands was one, like a son of man, so he looked like a man, clothed with a long robe, with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze you find in the furnace, and his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun, shining in full strength. What chapter was that? Revelation chapter 1. You see some similarities there? You see some similarities? Now, see, one of the things that has always bothered me from being a new Christian is in Exodus Moses is talking with God uh, let's, let's flip back to Exodus we're going to go uh, I think it's chapter 12 let me double check no I'm sorry let's go to Exodus 33 Starting in verse 17, God is speaking with Moses. Okay? And the Lord said to Moses, the word Lord there, notice that it's all caps. Most of your translation should have it all caps. You know what that means? Can somebody tell me what that means? Yahweh. Yahweh. Yeah. It's the name of God. He is referring to the personal name of God. The name by which God identified himself. So he says, and the Lord spoke to Moses, This very thing that you have spoken I will do, for you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. Moses said, Please show me your glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord, Yahweh. 
And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and show mercy to whom I will show mercy. But, he said, you cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. And the Lord said, behold, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock. And while my glory passes uh, by, I will put you in the cleft of the rock and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. What's that indicate to you? You can't see my face. Pretty simple. No one can see God's face and live. Got it? Pretty basic. It is what it is, unless some reason or another, it can't be what it is. Okay? So, right here, God is telling Moses, no one can see me, no one can see my face and live. I got a bit of a problem now. Because let's back up a little bit earlier in the chapter. I'm going to start in, well, actually, I'll just read verse 11. Okay? Verse 11 is talking about the tent of the meeting. It says, Thus the Lord, again, Yahweh, the same name, the same person, thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. When Moses turned again into the camp, his assistant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, would not depart from the tent. I've got a dilemma. Why is it that God says no one can see his face and live, and yet earlier in the chapter he's just spoken face to face with Moses? Look, it's not, um, he's not making an illustration here because he even goes further and says, as a man speaks to his friend. Okay? He's not saying that Moses went in and just spoke to the voice of God and God saw his face. It's face to face. Moses is looking at Yahweh's face. How then can God turn around and say, no one can see my face and live? Because if that were the case, Moses would have been dead before that conversation. I have a dilemma. How do we reconcile this? We reconcile this because the Trinity has always been. The three parts of a triune God has always been. It didn't come into creation. God did not fracture himself at some point because plans went awry. God has always been a triune being. We're going to flip to some verses here in the Old Testament that talk about the triune being of God. But the very first thing, uh, Genesis chapter 1, God says, let us. Now, I know Hebrew tradition is, is, takes that because the, the us there is a plurality. We understand us. okay. But what, what we don't understand is that the Hebrew is unique and that the word used for us there doesn't mean two or more. It means three or more. Okay? That's unique. We don't have that kind of thing in our language. What does several mean? See, I always grew up that a couple was two and several was three or more. Yeah. It's, you know what? There's two, two definitions in the dictionary for several. Two or more or three or more. <laughs> and then I think one of them says up to seven. <laughs> no wonder people hate English. <laughs> you know, we can't, even we, we can't even come to a reasonable agreement on what the word should mean. But in the Hebrew, the word specifically means three or more. Now, the Hebrew understanding of that is God being one, Okay? We understand that God is one. There is no other God before or after Him. There is only one. 
Why then would he say, let us, three or more? The Jewish thinking is he's speaking to the angels. What? But nowhere in Scripture do we have indication that God used the angels. It says he spoke, and it was. So why would they're his consulting team? Architectural engineers. Gabriel! <laughs> what do you think about this model for DNA? You know, the angels are above us, but they're nowhere near God. You understand that? God has made the angels to be above us. But they are not godlike. See, Lucifer, we believe from Scripture, was the chiefest of the angels, one of the archangels, serving at the very throne of God, one of the, the high ups. And he rebelled against God, and God went, Psh, out you go. And on that day, he will be brought before judgment. He will be cast down. He will be bound up. Because God said so. Okay? Satan bigger than me? You betcha. Can Satan touch me? Only if my dad lets him. Only whatsoever God will allow him. Look at Job. Satan comes before the throne of God, and God says, Hey, look at this one. Check him out. Yeah, he's doing great. He honors you. He blesses you. You won't let me touch him. Okay? He can only do unto us what our Father allows. Amen. Now, the caveat to that is, you've got to have the same Father I got. Because otherwise, Satan is your Father. That's what Jesus says. Okay? You got, you're born into this world in sin, Satan's your Father. It's only through the grace of the cross, through faith in the grace of the cross, that we have the right to become children of God. We get a new day. One that has a whole lot more our interests at heart. Okay? So, we have this, this, this powerful creature, creation. Now, you understand Satan was a created being, right? Okay? God created him just like he created us. The methodology was different. I don't know what they used to make the angels. They used dirt for us. I'm okay with that. You know? He made, made us out of dirt, but he breathed life into us. So that's what makes us unique. That's what makes us different. Okay? So, a created being. So why would God consult with a created being about creation? I don't think it has anything to do with the angels. I think that's a desperate attempt on the behalf of Jews today to keep Jesus from being who he is. I think they are blinded. Romans tells us they are blinded for a time. Thank God they are blinded for a time because Romans also makes a point to clarify that they're blinded on our behalf so that we can come to grace. Do you understand that? Paul says that they are enemies of ours so that we the season of the Gentiles, that we might come to grace. But there will come a day. I'm, you know, I, I read an article, and actually there were two articles uh, in the last week. Uh, do you guys know who Stephen Hawking is? Okay, Stephen Hawking, Hawking is a, a, a brilliant idiot. <laughs> okay? He's a, he's a brilliant idiot. That passage that, that um, Kevin read this morning, uh, that's, that's Stephen Hawking. Okay? Stephen Hawking is not going to go to an international shindig of smart people because it's being held in Israel and he's going to stand with the Palestinians in the boycott of Israel. Dumb. Okay? Now, that in itself doesn't surprise me. If you've read any of Stephen Hawking's stuff, he's very obviously an atheist. Okay? But even Stephen Hawking can't get us past point X. Okay? Do you guys know what point X is? 
Okay? In physics, when they go back in evolution, they can get us to point X. Whatever their philosophy is, whether it's the, the two uh, carbon molecules that floated around through the infinite infinity of space, they can't get us past where did the molecules come from? Point X. I can take you back to that point, but nobody understands how to get beyond that point. Where did the molecules come from? He admitted that. And then his, his extraordinarily high IQ of stupidity, he still refuses to acknowledge the truth. That it came because God said it would. Where did it come from? God. Well, where did God come from? He's always been. We don't understand that because we don't understand. We didn't, what do we have that's always been? What do we have that has always been? Because we can look back and we can date things and figure out they've been here for a long time. The Redwoods in California have been there for a long time. But they haven't been here forever. Okay? So we don't understand this infinity thing. But what bothered me was the second article where the head of the Church of Scotland agreed with Stephen Hawking. What does the light have to do with darkness? Okay, so the head of the Church of Scotland turns around and says, oh yeah, all those prophecies, all those promises in the Bible, they're not for Israel. They're for the church. The church is the new Israel. I don't see a new Israel in Scripture anywhere. Okay, I see new children of Abraham, a new understanding of the children of Abraham. Who are the children of Abraham? Those of faith. See, because I'm a rock. I'm the son of a rock. God can raise up from these very rocks children of Abraham. That's me. Okay, God may be a child of Abraham because of faith. All right, so the Church of Scotland says Israel's out. <clears throat> what that really says is God screwed up. God couldn't hold it together. God blew it. Well, then, oh, no, no, no. It wasn't God that blew it. It was Israel that blew it. You don't think God is omniscient? He doesn't know everything always? So he put this plan into effect in a desperate gamble of hope? <clears throat> I'm going to promise these things to Israel. Oh, you blew it. I better find someone else. Got to have another 400 years of silence to figure this one out. <laughs> Come on. Just think about it logically. Do you really believe that what you believe is really real? Is he omnipotent? Is he capable of holding it together? Yes. Is he omniscient? Did he know what was coming? Yes. So then what's the problem? Well, look at them now. They're the Messiah killers. Sorry, but it was my sin that put him up on the cross. You understand? There's no one innocent. I'm the Christ killer. You're the Christ killer. I've diverged. <laughs> Let's come back. Okay? No, because I didn't go backwards, I just went to the right. <laughs> okay, so we talked about how can Moses sit face to face with God, and then a few verses later, God say, no one can see my face, lest he die. I believe earnestly it's because God has always been a triune being. He's always existed in three parts. Okay? Now... A lot of people look to the New Testament at the birth of Christ, sometimes even at the baptism of Christ, as like the introduction of the triune being of God. There he is. He's born a man, fully God, fully man, the Son of God. There, he's a bayou being. Is that a word? <laughs> bayou? What would the word for that actually be? Well, just, just go with me. And then... Then, at the baptism, into the water he goes, up out of the water he comes. God's Spirit descends on him. Oh, now he's a triune being. That still leaves us with the dilemma of the first part of Genesis, where he speaks in a plurality of himself. Flip over to Isaiah. I'm going to read a couple passages out of Isaiah. This, when I read this, 
just blew my mind. Isaiah chapter 48. I'm going to start in verse 12, and I'm going to read uh, through 16. It says, Listen to me, O Jacob, and Israel, whom I call. I am he. I am the first, and I am the last. My hand laid the foundation of the earth. My right hand spread out the heavens. When I call to them, they stand forth together. Assemble all of you and listen. Who among them has declared these things? The Lord loves him. He shall perform his purpose on Babylon and his arm shall be against the Chaldeans. I, even I, have spoken and called him. I have brought him, and he will prosper in his way. Draw near to me, hear this. From the beginning, I have not spoken a secret. From the time it came to be, I have been there. And, the, and now the Lord God has sent me and his spirit. Now back up. Who's talking here? Back up to verse 12. Listen to me, O Jacob, and Israel, whom I call. I am he. I am the first, and I am the last. There's another passage that says that a little bit different, but with the same meaning. I am the Alpha and the Omega. According to the New Testament understanding, who is this speaking? Jesus Christ. Well, we see, we say, oh, it's God. Because my hand laid the foundation of the earth. But then we come forward, jump all the way down to 16. And it says, and now the Lord God has sent me. Oh, we got a problem now. How can God send the one who created the heavens and the earth if God created the heavens and the earth? Is God fractured? No, he's triune. Because look at the very next passage. And his spirit. God the Father, God the Son, and God His Spirit. See, the Trinity didn't just spring up in Matthew. It's throughout His Word. It is throughout His Word. We're going to flip over in Isaiah again. Uh, flip over to Isaiah chapter 61. A couple pages over. You guys probably are familiar with this passage. Check this out. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. We have the Trinity again. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. We see that in the baptism of Jesus Christ. God's Spirit rested on Jesus. Because the Lord, not the Spirit of the Lord, the Lord, Yahweh, has anointed me to do what? To do those things that Jesus came and did. He has accomplished. Remember on the cross he said, it is finish. What is necessary to be done is done. <coughs> we have the Trinity listed here again in the Old Testament. See, Jesus wasn't a spur of the moment out for God. Jesus is the image of of the invisible God. The God that cannot be seen lest man would die has made a way for himself to be seen by man. There are a number of passages, and I'm, I'm not going to get into this. This was actually a section that I, I pulled out 
But if you would like to borrow this book, it's an absolutely fantastic book. Uh, it's written by uh, a man of Jewish, I guess it would, would you say, I guess it would be Hebrew descendancy, but he's, he's a Christian, he's a Messianic Jew, uh, he's a completed Jew. He's understood and received the promises. But he goes through with a Jewish understanding of what's being said in the Old Testament in light of the full understanding of Scripture. And boy, he pulled some things out of there that just astounded me. But one of the things that he talked about is the angel of the Lord. And that's another one of those things that always bugged me. Because sometimes the angel appears and the people fall on their face and the angel goes, no, 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 no don't, don't worship me. Worship God in heaven. And other times, they fall on their face and he accepts it. What? I believe that when the angel of the Lord appears, big A, angel, that it is Jesus Christ. The messenger of God coming to deliver God's message just like he did in the New Testament, except in a different form. Okay? And we see this over and over and over again. Okay? Even in the New Testament, we see when angels appear to people, if they fall down and worship me, he says, don't worship me, worship God. But the angel of the Lord always receives the worship. Why? Because I believe it is the Son of God. Okay? If you're interested in the book, fantastic book, read it. Uh, it is called um, Jesus in the, Hebrew in the Hebrew Scriptures by Meno, M-E-N-O, Kalisher, K-A-L-I-S-H-E-R. K-A-L-I-S-H-E-R. Okay? Um, so, I want to I want to point out a couple things in the New Testament. Don't worry about turning here because these are just a couple of verses I want to read. John chapter 8. Jesus is talking to the, uh, the Jewish leaders. And he's talking about uh, Abraham and Moses and why, why are the Jewish leaders not accepting him? The Jewish leaders are like, hey, show us a sign. The whole thing that brought this about is I just healed the blind guy. What more signs do you need? Well, show us another one. Well, I healed the guy with the crippled hand on the Sabbath, and he yelled at me for healing on the Sabbath. What more signs do you need? John chapter 8, verse 57 through 59. So the Jews said to him, You are not yet 50 years old, and have you seen Abraham? They, being kind of cocky with their brilliant stupidity. Okay? Have you seen Abraham? If they knew who they were talking to, you think those words would have come out of the mouth? Because look at Jesus' response. This is awesome. Jesus said to them, truly, truly. Now that, that truly, truly there, that is the absolute integrity. This is the utmost truth. The fact that it's reiterated means that there is no variation in this. This is truth. Okay? Some of your, your scriptures might say, I tell you truly. Some of them might say, verily, verily. Okay? But the, the same meaning in the Greek means this is the absolute truth. Okay? So he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, <clears throat> before Abraham was, I am. So they picked up stones to throw at him. <coughs> but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. Now, before Abraham was, I am. Why does he pick up rocks? See, Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am. I am is the name that God used, the personal name that God used for himself. I am. And Jesus just made himself equal to God. He is proclaiming, I am the same as God. Okay, in another place, he calls himself the son of God, and they pick up rocks. For the same reason. Because the son has an equality with the God, that, with, or with the father, that the servants do not. Okay? So, when Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am. So, Jesus was born before Abraham? Jesus was created before Abraham? No. Remember, let's go back to the scripture we started off with. Before the foundation of the world, the Lamb was slain. John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything that was made that was made. So, who is He talking about? Who is the Word? Well, He says later, the Word was Jesus. He came into the world. 
Okay? So in the beginning, now that doesn't mean that in the beginning he was created, that at the beginning of what we know as the beginning, he already was. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. See, Jesus Christ contains in himself everything that is godly. He is God. Okay? He is what we classify in our own attempt to understand him as the second part of a triune God. Okay? Spoken about in the Old Testament, fulfilled in the New Testament. Sitting in heaven, chomping at the bit, waiting to take his people home. Okay? Now, you need to understand this, because when Jesus comes the second time, it's not going to be pretty. Because he's coming back as the offended God. He's coming back as the angry creator of all life. He's coming back with justice for those who have not received His grace. It's going to be ugly. We look as Christians at the coming back of Jesus with hope, with the glory that will be ours in Him. And that's great if we are Christian, but if you're not Christian, if you do not belong to Him, you should fear this day because it is going to be or beyond imagination. He's coming back angry. He is not pleased. He is restraining his wrath for a time that the full measure might be gathered in. He is restraining his wrath for our sake. He's restraining his wrath for the sake of his people Israel. But on that day, the gates come down and he will pour out his wrath. Now, Kevin was sharing with us the Great Commission, and I want to tell you, you have to understand what this means. That those people that you hang out with at work, the ball field, wherever you may be that do not know Him, that have not accepted Him as Lord and Savior, they are going to fall under the unrestrained wrath of God. And you might be their only hope. You. Oh, there's lots of Christians, Pastor Glenn. Well, let one of them tell them. What if God has you there to tell them? I'll tell you what, let me change that. God has you there to tell them. He's told you so. Go. Tell them. Look, you don't think God is desperate? Do you think God wants to pour out His wrath on man? Do you think that's His desire? No. That's the necessity of His justice. That's what His justice requires. But His heart desires that all men would be saved. I'm going to wrap up with this. I know I've gone a little bit long today. Um, one question that popped into my mind very early on in my walk. Why did Jesus have to become a man? Why? Why couldn't God have just gone, faith, and done? He can do anything. Why not that? See, God didn't come for His, on His behalf. He came on ours. Genesis chapter 3. Man has fallen. Don't worry about turning down. I'm just going to read one passage. Man has fallen. God walked in the cool of the evening in the garden. He's walking in the garden, wanting to spend time with Adam and Eve. And they're hiding. And, and God called out, Adam, where are you? As if God doesn't know. Okay, Adam, come out from behind the poison ivy. <laughs> <laughs> And God sees what happens, and he lays out a curse. He curses man, he curses woman, he curses the serpent. But see, in his cursing of the serpent, he also gives us the first promise of redemption. Because see, Genesis chapter 3, verse 15 says, 
speaking to the snake, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Do we see the fulfillment of that at the cross? Satan, playing his end game, ah, the Messiah. <laughs> we'll see how he likes death. And he bruised his heel. He put him on the cross. He killed him. And God raised him from the dead on our behalf. And he's bruising the devil's head every day since. Okay? We have the first promise of a Savior right there. Why did he have to come? Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15 says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. I tell you what, this gives me hope. This gives me courage. Because I have a Savior who is not unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. That gives me hope. Because see, Jesus went through it all. Everything that I fail at, He succeeded at. And He knows what it costs. Do you notice what they call the throne? It's the throne of grace. Right now, he is seated on the throne of grace. You approach him now. You're approaching the throne of grace. But there will come a day when he will sit on the throne of judgment. I thank God I came to this throne and not that. Amen. Amen. So why did he come as a man? So that in every way, he would know what our struggles are. He understands. He was fully God, fully man. It hurt him when people doubted him. It hurt him when people doubted his father. It hurt him when he took the beating on our behalf. It hurt him when they put him on the cross. Physically, he understands. Emotionally, he understands. Okay? The last thing I want to read with you, Hebrews chapter 10, uh, verse 10 through 14. And by that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. And every priest stands daily at his service offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sin. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. So he came as a man to do what we couldn't do. To live a perfect, sinless life. To take upon himself our just punishment. To sympathize with our weaknesses, with, with our failures. Look, don't feel like your sin is unforgivable. Because if you approach the throne of grace, God can forgive you. God wants to forgive you. God does not want to mete out His justice upon you. He wants you to live in His grace. One sacrifice for all time. That's all that was needed. All that was necessary. It is finished. The image of the invisible God. Wow. One day we will see him face to face. One day we will see God face to face. That excites me. Amen. Amen.